Thanks for being here this morning. Woo, there we go. I'm on now. Um, thanks for being here this morning. If you're a guest and visiting with us, we're really uh, happy to have you. Uh, there are cards on the back of the seat in front of you. There's one side for members, one side for guests. If you would fill those out for us, you can place them in the uh, collection plate. When it comes by, there's a spot on there for prayers. So if you have something that you would like for uh, the leadership, our members to be in prayer about, please, please uh, write that down, put it on the card, put it in the plate, and we pray over those uh, every Monday morning, and that goes out to all of our leadership also. I hope that you picked up a bulletin on your way in this morning. Uh, they're always important, but that thing is loaded this morning with a lot of good things. Uh, this morning in all the lobbies, you see all the small group directories as we kick off our small groups. For the fall, men, you have a retreat coming up at the end of October. You have a trout fishing trip coming up at the start of October. Uh, there's an Outback America that is coming up, uh, par golf events. So just a lot of good information in there and, and contacts and people to, to get in touch with on the different events that we have coming up over the next uh, few weeks and months. We are thankful to have Dr. Rubel Shelley back with us this morning. Uh, he was here last week and is here again. Uh, and thankful to have Cade leading us in worship this morning. Appreciate his talents there. As we begin this morning, uh, let's go to God in prayer and ask him to be a part of this and what we do this morning. God, we, uh, we pause this morning and come before you as we begin this worship to you. God, we thank you for just all you have done for us. God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the hope that we have in him. We thank you for the sunshine today and the ways that you show yourself in creation. And God, as we come to worship you this morning, as we lift up our voices in song, as we pray, as we uh, worship, as we listen to Dr. Shelley, as we sing, we just pray that your spirit and presence will be among us. 
And God, we pray that all we do will be done nothing more than to bring honor and glory to your name. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the hope that we have in him. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand, please. I will worship with all of my heart. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. 
But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Please be seated as we take our offering. Turn my heart, O Lord, like a river of water. Turn my heart, O Lord, by your hand till my We start the communion this morning. Let me just read out of Mark 5, uh, beginning in verse 24. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors, and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. And she heard about Jesus. And she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the crowd, people crowding against you as disciples answered, and, you, and yet you can ask, who touched me? Um, but Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. And then the woman, knowing what had happened to you, came and fell at his feet and, trembling with fear, told the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. 
I want to use this story to just kind of generalize <clears throat> how the world and sometimes Christians attempt to solve our problems. We too, too often look to the world to resolve our issues. Not that it's always a bad approach to use the gifts that God has given us to enrich our lives. And nothing against doctors. I have a son who is one. But this woman had searched for 12 years, 12 long years, spent all her money and suffered greatly, and it had not helped her at all. Then she finally finds Jesus, and in a moment, is completely healed. In this communion this morning, let's set our minds on the fact that Jesus has the power to save. His healings demonstrated his power and his compassion. This also clearly shows his power to forgive sins, as it says in other places, and provide spiritual healing. It's obvious to all that Christians can suffer in this world. And we can struggle with that. But our first priority is spiritual healing that puts us in a right relationship with God. We can search for years and spend lots of money that will never fix us. We need Jesus to really fix our brokenness. Now, why do you think Jesus spent the time to stop moving forward in this whole crowd and search uh, for this woman to embarrass her, to force her to confess what she had done? No, I, I don't think that. I think it, he wanted her to know it was okay, that his power is freely given. She had not snuck up and stole it from him. And to make the point that it was her faith that had healed her. And it's our faith that heals us. Let's spend the next few minutes remembering that Jesus is the only answer to heal our brokenness. And it's our faith in him that allows that to happen. If you'd pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, we're just grateful for your son and his sacrifice. We're grateful for this communion so that we can remember uh, our first priority which is you and his body that was given to build a bridge back to you. Help us to always remember that the spiritual healing is the first priority in our lives, to be in a good relationship with you. And it's through Jesus that we do that, and it's through his name that we pray. Amen. Oh
Father, we're just grateful for this fruit of the vine. It represents the blood that your son was willing to shed. He could have stopped it at any time, but he didn't. And it's the blood that watches, washes us clean. And we just want to praise him as Lord and Savior of the world and remember his example and his sacrifice. Be with us as we take this and be mindful of that. We are so grateful. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I need you more, more than yesterday, I need you more, more than words can say, I need you more than ever before, I need you more, I need you more. Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and unto 
unto the Lamb. Be praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honor and power and strength. Be to our God forever and ever. Be to our God forever. church. It's good to be back with you. I seldom get to go to a place two Sundays in a row. I'm there the first Sunday, and they say that's enough of that. But Lincoln booked me for two Sundays originally, so I got to come back. It's good to be back at Twickenham, and I appreciate what's going on in this church always. If you were following your bulletin, and most of you I'm sure weren't, you noticed that we changed the scripture reading because that would not have fit with the sermon that I'm going to preach, which is different from the sermon whose title is also on that bulletin. (laughs) Preachers always reserve the right to change their minds. During this past week, I've watched the news. I've read a few newspapers. I've had a few phone calls. I've been to a cemetery, and I decided, given what's going on in my life this week, I wanted to talk about something different than I had originally planned because I suspect some of you have watched and heard news, and you've read newspaper headlines, and you may have been to a funeral home or to a graveside, or you may have been in a hospital waiting room or you may have been the one to get a diagnosis, a letter in the mail, or just an abiding concern. Haven't you wondered why in a world created by a holy God who in his very nature is love, there is so much ugliness? There is so much in terms of of illness and death. There's so much in terms of conflict and argument. There's so much in terms of just polarization, whether it's by race or by economics or by political party. Haven't you wondered why, if there's a God of such infinite love and power, the world you and I inhabit is in the mess that it's in? It's a question believers are forced to come up against. And one of the things about the Christian religion, it never asks that we close our eyes to reality, even harsh and unpleasant reality. And so if you begin reading scripture, start back in the Jewish part of scripture. Start back in what we call the Old Testament, Job. He was crushed not only by illness, but by the loss of his fortune. The crops and the fields, his flocks and his herds, and as if that were not enough, the deaths of his children. What greater pain would there be for him to bear? Joseph, 
he was within his family favored initially by his father and yet the father's favor created sibling rivalry, sibling jealousy and his brothers first intending to kill him showed him mercy. They sold him off to a traveling caravan of slave traders and as he disappeared from sight they manufactured the lie to tell their father and dipped some of his clothing in animal blood and said, poor Joseph, he's dead. Ruth. Ruth is a story in the Bible that, that's impressive to me because Ruth is not Jewish. She's a Moabite, one of those people that for generations the Jewish people are to have nothing to do with and form no relationships with. And yet a Jewish family moves into the land near where she lives. A man and his wife and their two sons. And the two sons marry Moabite women. And lo and behold, the male head of the house. And then one and then the other son all die. And you have three women vulnerable terribly vulnerable in a world that's so male dominated and where to be alone as women left you at the mercy literally of the wolves. The older mother Naomi tells the girls probably it's better that you go back to your blood families because I I just feel I have to go back toward my homeland where I have kinspeople and one of the daughters, with, with tears and, and apparent sincere heartbreak, she bids farewell and she goes back. And then Ruth, Ruth weeps on her mother-in-law's shoulder and says, please don't beg me to go back to my family. You're my family now. And, and please don't beg me to leave you. Please don't, don't beg me to, to go back. I want to go with you. And where you go, I'll go. And where you live, I'll live. And... I'll learn a new language and I'll learn new customs. In fact, wherever it is you die is where I want to die and it's where I want to be buried. After a brief marriage, witted and then thrown into a really difficult situation. Then there are those women collectively, Sarah and Hannah and Elizabeth, what they have in common is that they were all childless for so many years. And that in a culture where to be childless was not just sad, we always wanted a baby. It was viewed as a mark of judgment from God that you were left childless. Then there was Daniel. Because he's a man of prayer, his reward is he gets thrown into a pit with lions Prophets are mocked and they're murdered. In the book of Hebrews, where those heroes of faith are talked about in Hebrews 11, there's one paragraph that talks about not how they were delivered, but how this one was murdered and this one was tortured and this one was sawed in half. Where is God when all those things are happening? Where is God when Job is suffering? When Hannah is begging for a baby? When Daniel is at the mercy of a pagan king. Closer to the time of Jesus, think maybe about John the Baptist. Now John the Baptist was, was physically kin to Jesus and was in on the family secret. His mother, Elizabeth, and Jesus' mother, Mary, had rejoiced with each other at their pregnancies and had, by revelation from the Spirit of God, it had been made known to both of them that the child Mary was bearing would be the Messiah. And it was in fact John who first publicly introduced Jesus when Jesus came to be baptized by John himself with a special mission. He points to him and he, he cries out to the crowd, look, there is the Lamb of God. The one who has come to take away the sins of the world. That is confirmed to John and to Jesus when at the baptism the Father's voice speaks, this is the beloved one. 
hear him. It's confirmed by a dove descending, lighting on him, a symbol of the presence of the Holy Spirit, Jesus' endowment with power from that point forward in his life. And yet, John soon is thrown into jail. A bleak place called Machiris where Herod put some of the worst of criminals. Now John's offense was that he had been preaching and among the other things that he'd been preaching was the moral obligation of people to live in obedience to God and and he'd rebuked Herod because he had seduced his own brother's wife to leave the brother and come and live with him. And oh, by the way, she was the niece of both of them. It's incestuous. It's adulterous. It would have been pretty hard for John to talk about morality and not to name so public a case. And so John is in prison, not for being a criminal, but for telling a truth that's very unpleasant to someone who's in power. And you probably know the end of the story that it's going to end with John's not being released and exonerated, but being murdered. But do you remember what happens in the interval where he's thrown into prison and he's in those dark, lonely hours waiting to know what his fate will be? And John raises the question, why is there so much ugliness in a world that's created by a God of beauty and love and power and truth? John even begins to wonder if he has missed the signs and the messages that he thought had been given to him about his having a role in the plan of God to bring the Messiah, who the Messiah was. And so in fact... In Luke 6, verse 19, when a couple of his disciples came to visit him in prison, he sent them on a mission, go find cousin Jesus and ask him, are you really the one who was to come? Or should we be looking for somebody else? I don't hear John's question as a mean question, not a mocking question. I hear John's question as a tearful question. John is saying, if there is a God of love and power and I'm serving him, if I have identified his beloved son, our Messiah, correctly, why is this happening to me? I've only told the truth. Does it surprise you that one of the heroes of faith, John the Baptist, just went through a period of depression, but he doubted God? He raised the hard question, and he wondered if Jesus was the real thing. I've had my own moments. Any of you? I've been in emergency rooms. I've been in family dens. I've been in funeral homes with people who've cried out with some version of what Job asked and what Ruth wondered about and what Daniel squirmed over and what John sent disciples to inquire about. If there is a God, how can this be happening? In fact, I suppose there are no better words to sum it up than my God. Have you forsaken me? Oh, but you recognize those words, don't you? Those are words that Jesus of Nazareth uttered while he was dying on the cross. Jesus, who for three plus years had been going about healing, a woman who'd had a hemorrhage for a dozen years and doctors couldn't help her, 
who had brought Lazarus back to life. Surely anyone with power like this, the presence of God is with him. Nicodemus thought so. Teacher, we know that nobody could do what you're doing unless God were blessing him. God is the one who's giving you that power. Jesus was confirmed in that. After his baptism by John, when it was confirmed to him the Father's own voice out of heaven, he goes back to the synagogue in Nazareth. He, he's asked to be the reader that day. And he asks for the scroll of Isaiah and turns and he reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to do X, Y, Z, Q, things that only Messiah would do. Give sight to the blind, healing to those who were ill, freedom to those who were prisoners. And he rolled it up and handed it back and said, Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He interpreted various Old Testament texts to the twelve. And they in turn were sent out to interpret those texts for others to claim that they are fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth. But before he cried out, my God. God, why have you forsaken me on that Friday? Remember that on Thursday night, he's praying in the garden. And sweat is rolling off of him as if he were bleeding. And he's saying, let this cup pass from me. You're a holy and powerful God. You love me, I know you do. But if you do, why? Let this cup pass. Why are there such awful things as hurricanes that devastate the Bahamas so that today tens of thousands of people they don't have a home to go to. They don't have any safe water to drink. They don't have electricity. They don't have refrigeration. They don't have medical care. They're going to die by the dozens and hundreds yet, and we don't have an accurate death count, though it's going up by the hour. Not from the storm, but because in the aftermath of it, enough help cannot get there quickly enough to keep them from dying. Why are there people who get a cancer diagnosis? As my father did. Why are there people who, as my mother, get the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and go for years not knowing who they are or anybody around them? Why is there such evil in the world that people take weapons into El Paso and murder indiscriminately? Why do people fly planes into towers? Why is there so much poverty? Why are there dozens of wars being fought right now in so many places in the world? Why the stories in Dashville and Huntsville newspapers about robbery and rape and murder? And why are decent and good people often the victims? Oh, if, if criminals only did their bad things to each other, you might think, but it's... It's the vulnerable, it's the elderly, it's the weak, it's the innocent person. Why? Jesus tells a story one day. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads... Then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servant said, Well, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you'd uproot the wheat with them. So... They both have to grow together until the harvest. And at that time, I'll tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles for burning and then gather the wheat and bring that into my barn. That's one of the few parables. Jesus doesn't do this with many. It's one of the few parables that Jesus later, when asked, interprets it. Here's the interpretation. 
The one who sows the good seed is the son of man himself, and the field is the world, and the good seed is the people of the kingdom. The weeds, they're the people and the deeds of the evil one. He is the enemy. He is the devil. And the harvest is at the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels. And as the weeds are pulled up and burned in fire, so it will be at the end of the age when the Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and pain and evil. The fundamental lesson that we Christians need to remember at times when we're watching the news and reading the newspaper, when somebody we love has been impinged upon by cancer, has been the victim of a terrible automobile accident, whether they're responsible or someone else, when there are wars going on, when there are people dealing with poverty or who've been mugged or raped or murdered. This is not the world God created and meant to be inhabited. This is a world that has been cursed by what we call the fall. It is a world that's living under the curse of sin. It's a world where the prince of darkness is casting a long, long shadow. The creation story tells the story of, of a paradise, a garden park where there's innocence and where there's openness and where the relationship between human beings is one of absolute trust and goodness and the relationship is equally as open between God and his human creatures. But then humans bite the apple, we don't know. What kind of a tree, what kind of a fruit in the story represents the human response to temptation to throw off God? To fall for the lie that, you know, we can be gods ourselves. We can take charge. We can run this play. We don't need an outside voice. And we're living in a world where our hands are too much on the controls. And where because we've looked too often to our skills and to our wisdom and to our abilities. We've taken the world into our hands and we've made a royal mess out of it. In the story that Jesus tells, in the stories in Matthew 13 beginning at 24 if you want to. Read it for yourself later. It's a kingdom parable. Jesus says, yeah, the world that God meant for you to inhabit is not the world you're living in now, but it's not the world that one day you will live in because one day the Son of Man will return in glory and the angels of God will uproot the weeds, the tares that have grown among the wheat, and you will have the world that we always meant for you to live in. The Bible calls it the new heavens and the new earth. Isaiah predicts it. John, in the closing chapters of Revelation, affirms it to us yet again. Jesus is talking here between those two prophets to say, God's purpose is not going to be defeated. Those of you who trust God through the dark times, it's not sinful for you to ask a hard question. It's not evil that the doubt crosses your mind. But believe that God has responded to your question by saying it was not meant to be this way. It is this way because there is an enemy at work in the cosmos. And that enemy has sowed bad seed. And that enemy has created temptation. And that enemy is trying to destroy. But one day I'll set it right. As simple as it may sound, I think the fundamental thing that every believer has to remind herself, himself of in the dark times is this. God is who Scripture says He is. 
God is love, and there is no evil. There's no darkness in him at all. And the source of my troubles, the source of my pain, the source of my heartache is not God. Sometimes in a fallen world, the source of a given problem is <laughs> we live in a world that's governed by natural law, regularities. Gravity works for everybody, including Christians. And we can take a misstep and we can pay for it. We can take our eyes off the highway and lose control and pay for it. But at a more serious level, freedom that God gave us, we misused it. And it's like the gift of fire. Fire is a wonderful thing. You warm by it in the cold times and you cook over it and things are better. But fire is a dangerous gift too. You let it get out of control. Well, it's like freedom. We would not be in the image of God if we were robots. We are made free and we've misused our freedom. And because we've misused our freedom and we've taken our own hands and put them on the controls and taken them away from God, we've introduced weeds into God's well-prepared field and the good seed that has been sown in it. The oldest book of your New Testament comes rather near the end. It's the little epistle of James. James was written about A.D. 45. It's the oldest piece of the New Testament. It's written to Christians who've been scattered from Jerusalem because of now not one but two persecutions. The first one in Acts 8 started, of all things, by Saul of Tarsus, who later would become a Christian and repent what he had done. And then in Acts chapter 12, that followed by Herod Antipas, the very Herod that had killed John the Baptist. Herod now is turning on the disciples of Jesus, and he kills John... Uh, I'm sorry, kills James, the brother of John. Remember the four fishermen, Peter, Andrew, James, John. He kills that James, need to keep him distinguished from the James who writes this epistle. This is James who is the brother of Jesus. Antipas kills James, the brother of John, the fisherman apostle. And when he sees that he can get by with it, he arrests Peter and he gets ready to kill him. A lot of Christians just got out of Jerusalem following that. They said, it's not safe for us to be here. And so James, the brother of Jesus, writes this letter. And it's addressed to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, the 12 tribes, God's new Israel, now scattered, now dispersed away from your home city, Jerusalem, and away from what you thought was a safe place near the temple where God met with his people. And James opens by saying, I know you're going through a hard time. You're facing trials, you're facing temptations. But here's James' affirmation. The scripture read to you a few moments ago. When you're being tempted, don't ever say God is the one doing it. God can't be tempted by evil, and He doesn't tempt anyone. But we are tempted when we're dragged away by our own, our own evil desires and enticed. You see, the, set, uh, the, the Satan has put worms on all the hooks. Everything that could harm us, he's made look as attractive as possible so that if we go and bite, in fact, that's exactly the language used here in verse 14. It's the language about a fishing lure. He said, when we're enticed and we bite the hook, then when those evil desires have conceived, they give birth to sin. Then sin, when it's grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Watch. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who doesn't change like the shifting shadows. God is light and there is no darkness in Him. Well, where then all the shadows? If God has prepared a good field, a good creation, and filled it with good things, why all the evil? There is an enemy at work. And church, here is where our faith is founded. 
How do we know that it's worth hanging on during the dark times and that God will make good his promise to rescue all of creation from what it's currently suffering? The cross and an empty tomb. The cross says the God who saw the mess we'd made of his creation didn't walk away. He walked in. It's called the incarnation. God takes flesh. The second person of the Holy Trinity, the eternal word, the Logos, comes and he dwells in flesh and he's tempted in all the ways that we are. He confronts Satan personally in the 40 days in the wilderness and then having defeated him personally, he goes to the cross and he defeats him for our sakes. But it looks like he's been defeated and if there was ever a day in hell that champagne corks popped, that was the day. But that was Friday. And on Sunday morning, the tomb was empty. And he showed himself alive repeatedly to first one and then another and then over 500 at once. Witnesses of all sorts and varieties to say when sin has done its worst and when death seems to have triumphed, when you live in a world where it appears that darkness is the rule, the light breaks through in the resurrection promise of Jesus and that promise is to you so that if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation and the old things, they pass, you're done with them. You owe them nothing else. You're a new creation living in a new grace-filled environment. All things are become new for you. And the promise of holding on, trusting in the dark times means that the cross and the empty tomb have achieved their purpose in your life. And so if you suffer now, God himself came among us and he experienced no less than we do. And we will never experience as much as he did. But the promise of God is that all who are in Christ have been brought into a new creation. And one day in the new heavens and the new earth still will live the experience that God always wanted you to have. three times in our life together. I don't know how my wife put up with it. I don't mean anything I did. Particularly those three pregnancies. The heartburn, the kicking, the pain, the couldn't sleep. And finally, the trauma of giving birth. Paul uses that metaphor and he says, All of creation is going through the pains of childbirth right now. And it ain't fun. But when the promise has been delivered, and I've never once heard her complain about any one of those children that she bore. He said the same thing will be true when Jesus returns and when his resurrection glory is shared with you. Pray with me. Holy God, sometimes it's hard to hold on because we focus more on the pain than the promise. At any given moment, it just isn't fun. Evil is no longer an abstraction. It has made its way into our lives. Maybe sometimes because we have sinned and we brought some terrible catastrophe on ourselves. An embarrassment, a criminal indictment, a jail cell, or all sorts of pains that may go with that. It seems even worse when it falls down on us as innocent victims of those who are the agents of evil to inflict their pain. And God, we could wish at times that we were impervious to heart disease or kidney failure or cancer. Oh, but then when we'd all be Christians for the wrong reasons. It would just be cheap insurance. You ask us in the middle of our pain, in the midst of our doubts, our questionings, to trust. 
and to believe that in the hard moments it's worth holding on because you are always with us and your promise will never be forgotten. And when our Savior appears in glory, we will be like Him. Raised, victorious, made immortal, heirs to every promise that you've ever made for what's holy and good. For the person in this room who is in a dark place, passing through a difficult trial, who's made some awful mistake, who's committed some gut-riching sin, for somebody who's been the victim of another's evil, for somebody who's struggling with disease or facing death. Give us faith. Help us know that the cross testifies that you love us, that you have taken those pains onto yourself. And let us know that the cross leads to resurrection, an empty tomb, and the fulfillment of the promise of glory. We believe. Help our unbelief. Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. Amen. Let's stand. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can be so Thank you so much for the lesson this morning, and Cade and praise team. I mean, we've been here for 10 years, and our first Sunday morning here, we felt Jesus in the service. He was with us, and we continue to, I continue to feel that today. A lot has to do with you, and a lot has to do with our hearts, so I hope that that is not just me this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we come to you, we come to you with heavy hearts. Uh, this world is, it's a fallen creation, and it is evident every day. Um, we ask that you please help us to lift up those who are affected by the hurricanes, from the shootings, from, from everything that seems to be coming into this world. Um, we ask that you continue the, for us to be in continuous prayer for them, uh, 
to keep them in our hearts, keep them in our minds, and help us to know that, that your power is not shown in the storms and near the evil that we see in this world is not from you. It's the compassion, the, compa- the care, and the love that follows from us, your followers, from us that love you, that it shows your power. We ask that you please be with the leaders of our country. Uh, this time is even more important for you to be the focus of our leaders and not themselves. We ask that you be with our firefighters, our police, our first responders. We thank you so much for their sacrifice, especially thank you for the sacrifice of their families in supporting them. Our military, Lord, our our safety, our freedom, we owe to them. We owe to them and their families who sacrifice. Please help us to keep them in our prayers, to keep them focused, keep us focused on their gift, their sacrifice. This morning we ask that you be with the sick, those that are hurting in our church. Lord, I know of some, but I know there are so many on the hearts of those in in the service that that needs your help, both physically and spiritually. Uh, Help us to keep them in our prayers. And this morning, we thank you so much for the gift that you've given to this church with Adam and Autumn, uh, the the inspiration, the guidance they're given to Tyler and the other kids. The encouragement, uh, it's, it's it's a gift from you and we can see that. We thank you so much for them. Thank you so much for the leaders with Lincoln and Cade Steve and everybody that that makes this church function so that we can focus on you. We thank you for them. And help us through this week to continue to seek you, not just when we need something, but also when we are celebrating the gifts that you've given us. Help us to keep you focused on our hearts and in our minds. And please be with us through the rest of this week in your son's name.